go. You have the words of eternal life. Hallelujah, hallelujah. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to the crowd, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Then the Jews began to complain about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They were saying, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, Do not complain among yourselves. No one can come to me unless drawn by the Father who sent me and I will raise that person up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Let's pray. Lord, we think we know you, and you have revealed yourself to us, but so much of what we think we know is but a beginning of living and growing and maturing in you. One lifetime, even if it spans a hundred years, is not enough, Lord, to begin to know and to understand you, to comprehend the depth of your love the fullness of your mercy and the endlessness of your grace. Do not let us fall into the trap of thinking we know you completely, but rather help us each day to grow more fully into you. And now, Lord, gather us around your word. Help us to hear it, and in hearing it, help us to live. We ask and pray all these things in your name. Amen. Good friends, grace, peace to you today from God, our Father, through our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. C.S. Lewis is one of the best writers about Christianity that the 20th century produced. He was an Englishman who had started out his life as an atheist, and after his experiences in the First World War and conversations with believers, he himself became a believer in Jesus Christ and spent the rest of his life writing about Christ and about the faith that one has in him. In the 1940s, he was doing a series of radio broadcasts talking about the Christian faith, which eventually became the book Mere Christianity. And in that broadcast, he was asked the question about who this Jesus was, because that is the question that human beings have been dealing with ever since Jesus was raised from the dead. And Lewis made the argument that would have been made by other people before him that Jesus had to be one of two things. He was either a madman, and perhaps even wicked for claiming that he was the Son of God, or he was who he claimed to be, the very Son of God. And if you think about that, Lewis is right. For someone to claim to be God is a pretty amazing thing to claim. I mean, if you were walking uptown to the post office tomorrow and somebody walked up to you and said, guess what, I'm God, you'd smile, yeah, you're smiling right now, and you'd probably think in the back of your mind, can I get away from this situation? And can I get this person help? Because for somebody to say I'm God, they must be crazy. It's a legitimate question to ask if someone makes that claim. And today's gospel reading is a small scene of people struggling with that very claim. 
Jesus says to those around him, pious Jews who have come to hear him and follow him, he says to them, I am the bread of life which comes down from heaven. I am the bread of life which comes down from heaven. And you can just see the faces going puzzled and concerned and anxious, glancing at one another, trying to figure out what this Jesus is saying. Because these are people who have worshipped the God of Israel all their lives. These are the people whose ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness that God provided during their 40-year sojourn from slavery in Egypt to the freedom of the promised land. These are people who, in the morning when they rose, recited the Shema, the prayer of every pious Jew, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. They knew that there was a God. And to hear Jesus claim to be the bread of heaven, which comes down from heaven, is like getting punched in the stomach. It took their breath away. Because it wasn't just the claim to be the bread that comes down from heaven, but it's that tiny little phrase, I am, that had to catch their attention. Because Jesus is always saying that. Throughout the Gospel of John, Jesus is saying, I am the bread of life. I am the good shepherd. I am the door. I am the gate. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. He says that over and over again in the Gospel of John. Go, when you have a chance, look through the Gospel of John and look at the number of times Jesus says that phrase. Because those who were hearing it that day were hearing more than just the beginning of a sentence. This scripture from Exodus was echoing in their minds as they heard Jesus speak. Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent you. I am on the lips of Jesus is claiming more than he's just the bread of life that comes down from heaven. I am on the lips of Jesus is saying to those who understood, I am God. Jesus is making that claim. I am. And those whose lives were centered around worship in the temple and the Torah, the history of the Jews, the men in the wilderness, to hear someone making that claim had to raise within them all kinds of emotions. The, the I am's wash over us like nothing because we're so used to hearing them. But to those who were hearing them for the first time, heard them with horror with scorn, with anger, and with sorrow. They had to believe that Jesus must be crazy. For how else could somebody make such a claim? What sane person would commit the blasphemy of saying that they are God? He had to be mad. They knew Jesus. They knew his family. They knew where he was from. They knew him as the carpenter's son, as Mary's boy. They knew him. At least they thought they knew him. And especially because they believed that they knew and understood who he was, what he was now saying to them made absolutely no sense at all. How could someone that we've watched grow up and mature into an adult even suggest such a thing. But it wasn't only crazy talk. It was dangerous talk. There were many who were listening to Jesus who would simply not tolerate that kind of talk. 
they would hear Jesus saying, I am, and right away their minds would begin to say to them, this man must be silenced. Because it's blasphemy to claim something about God that is not true. And if you claim to be God, if you're not, that is blasphemy. It is the worst crime that a Jew could commit. And under Jewish law, it was punishable by death. Death by stoning. You would be dragged into the public square and be stoned to death for claiming something about God that wasn't true. And you would not only put yourself in danger, but you put your family in danger and anybody who followed you in danger. That's the kind of emotions that little phrase brought up with those who heard Jesus. And you have to argue that they had common sense on their side. Who in their right mind would claim to be God? In our own time, history has been littered with people who have claimed to be some kind of Messiah. Think of Jim Jones a number of years ago who led all those people down to the jungles in Guyana and in South America and how 900 people drank poison Kool-Aid because he told them to. Or David Koresh down in Texas who let his entire group of people die in a fire because he believed he was some kind of Messiah. They had common sense on their side. People who claim to be God do all kinds of harm. They must be mad. And so how can Jesus dare to say, I am the bread of life? How can he be serious about that? Because we think we know who he is. We think we understand. We look at what the world tells us to be true and anything that Jesus says about himself just simply does not add up. Only a lunatic would talk that way. Jesus calls upon those who hear him to trust him. To believe that what he is saying to them is not only a truth, but the truth. And that's been the challenge for every generation of human beings from that time until this. For 2,000 years, hearing the voice of Jesus say, I am, and believe that to be true. Or to go with what the world would like to paint of Jesus, that he was at best a great teacher, a wonderful example to follow, perhaps even a very holy person, but he was just a person, just another human being. He couldn't be God if there is a God. That's what we hear in our world today, that if there is a God, he couldn't be a human being. Because we have the world that we understand our intellect, our science, our technology, our medical knowledge, our social and political structures, all of which in themselves can be a blessing to us, all tell us that this is the way things are among human beings. That we are the pinnacle of everything that there is. And for anyone to claim a truth other than the truths we define for ourselves, that person must be mad. That's what people have thought about Jesus from the very beginning. His own family one time came to take him home because they thought he had gone off his wheels. But Jesus speaks to a universal reality that no one can escape. A universal reality that everyone ever since and everyone here today will one day have to deal with regardless of technology or wisdom or power or wealth, or standing among human beings, every person will one day face the reality of their own death. No one escapes that. No one is exempt from that. No one gets a pass from death. Everyone goes down into the silence of the grave, and there is absolutely nothing that anything of this world can do about it. We can delay it, we can postpone it, we can shove it down the road 
years at a time, but ultimately, eventually, it comes. And everyone goes down into the dust, never to return. All the power and prestige of this world, all the truths that this world sets up for itself are of no avail. All those who scoffed at Jesus all those years ago are now lying in the dust of Palestine. And we will one day join them. And no action of human genius or skill or wisdom will alter that fact. The crowds who thought Jesus to be a lunatic, a blasphemer, someone worthy of death, all went down to the grave. The ones who crucified Jesus and who mocked him as he was dying are now dust. Those who betrayed him and abused him and killed him lie silent in their tombs. And if Jesus was indeed insane, if he was off his rocker, if he was crazy, then all any of us have to look forward to is an eternity in the dust. If what Jesus has said is not true. But the truth is that though Jesus was crucified and died on the cross and was buried in a borrowed tomb, that tomb did not hold him. The bonds of death that he surrendered to on the cross did not carry his body into corruption. Jesus does not lie in the dust of Palestine this day. Rather, God the Father raised him up on the third day, raised him from death to life, and in so doing affirmed everything that Jesus had ever taught or preached or proclaimed that he indeed is the bread of life, that he indeed is the good shepherd. He is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. He is the salvation of all who believe because he is the truth and the wisdom of God. Even though the world believes the wisdom of God to be folly and madness, Jesus is the only sanity in the world, the only truth. When we baptize, we baptize into the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is not some symbolic act. It is not simply water and words being spoken to perform a simple rite. It is a living reality that when we baptize, those who are baptized are joined to the dying and the rising of Jesus. They are crucified with him and buried with him in the grave and raised with him to live a new life. So what the world regarded as foolishness and folly and madness is the truth. We live in Christ who lives eternally. As St. Paul reminds us when he writes to the Christians at Corinth, the foolishness of God is wiser than all human wisdom. And even if the world regards God as foolishness, at the end of all things, when all things come to their final moment, it will be God in Christ who remains. And those who have heard the promise and lived in the promise and trusted in the promise will live with him and in him throughout eternity. So the world may look at baptism and see only water, but we see the salvation of God at work. We see eternity touching the earth. We see new life being brought forth and joined to the promises of Jesus, who is the way, who is the truth, and who is the life for all who believe. Amen.